welcome to New York Women in Film and Television's 40th Annual Muse Awards. 40 years. Today we celebrate the extraordinary achievements of our amazing muses who have given us brilliant performances, access to boundary-pushing content, and have shown a lifetime commitment to the industry. In January, NYWIT will celebrate a year under the fabulous leadership of Cynthia Lopez. It has been an absolute privilege to partner with Cynthia as she literally powered through her first year as executive director. Cynthia inspires us all with her dedication, hard work, and smarts, and I could not be more thrilled to introduce her to all of you. Cynthia Lopez. Welcome, muses. Each of you have impacted the media and entertainment industry so profoundly that it is actually hard to describe. Each one of you have overcome adversity, pushed creative boundaries, and provided opportunities for the next generation of cultural change agents, filmmakers, artists, and industry executives. From Gloria Stefan, who came to this country as an immigrant and overcame many obstacles and built a music and now media empire to Jane, yes, Gloria Estefan. <laughs> to Jane Rosenthal, who when 9-11 devastated our city and our country, she and Robert De Niro and their partners decided one sure way to revitalize the city was to start a festival to get New Yorkers back to the downtown area. Now, more than 140,000 people attend the Tribeca Film Festival every year. Thank you, Jane. All of the women on this stage, both the honorees and the Nywith board, live by the same principle. Create something in spite of your limitations. It reminded me of a life lesson that my mom tried to teach me when I was nine. You need to understand something very important about doors and thresholds. You need to thank all of the ancestors and the activists that came before you that have opened the door for you to be where you are today. And you need to make sure when you are crossing a threshold in the future, you hold the door for all of those who come behind you. All of the women we are honoring here today are doing just that. I am deeply touched and humbled that each of the honorees said yes when we called. Thank you for your tenacious spirit, conviction, and your relentless pursuit of following your creative dreams. In looking forward, I do want to recognize the women who were our founders. Without them, we couldn't be here today. So now it's time for the Made in New York Award. Let me tell you a little bit about Commissioner Ann Del Castillo and the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, MOM, as we like to call it. They run the nation's largest municipal TV, radio, and broadcasting entity, supports the local creative industries of theater, film, television, music, advertising, publishing, and digital media, and oversees the Office of Nightlife which works toward sustainable development of nightlife venues. The total creative and nightlife industries generate more than 600,000 jobs and 140 billion in economic output each year. Anne came to MOM um, a quarter of a century of work in film, production, public arts, and nonprofit administration. Under her leadership, MOM has worked to bring New Yorkers closer to our creative industries through job training, outreach, and more. Please welcome Commissioner Ann Del Castillo. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to go off script a little bit just to say happy anniversary to the Muse Awards. It's a 40 is fabulous. I am thrilled to be here with all of you to celebrate the women leading New York City's television and film industry. 
Today, we are honoring a true New Yorker, a visionary and an innovator. Over the course of her career, Caroline Hirsch has blazed a trail in New York City entertainment as the founder and owner of the iconic com comedy venue, Caroline's on Broadway. She continues to push the boundaries of what's possible in the business of comedy and for women in comedy in particular. My name is Caroline Hirsch and I'm made in New York. When I opened Caroline's, my thought was to elevate comedy as a high art form. I was able to jumpstart some careers and promote comedic talent. I never thought about not being able to accomplish anything because I was a woman in business. To receive this award, I'm totally taken back by it. I mean, New York City is the capital of the world. So if you receive this award from New York City, that's a sure sign of success. Caroline, on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio, I am pleased to present you with this Made in New York Award. Thank you so much. Oh, and thank you so much for this. Good afternoon. All of the very best things are made in New York. We have the best food, the best arts and culture, theater, film, television, and comedy. If, if someone had told me when I was growing up in Brooklyn, a young girl posed for a career in retail, that I would stand before you today celebrated for my work in New York's entertainment industry, I would have said they were crazy. I had the opportunity to partner with two friends in a small cabaret club on 8th Avenue in Chelsea way back in 1982. We called it Caroline's, and so was the birth of a brand that would thrive for more than 35 years. In the early days of the club, we booked cabaret talent, but we also started to book a group of hungry young comedians looking for their big break. In fact, the very first comedian I ever booked was an unknown kid from Boston named Jay Leno. <laughs> when my partners decided to leave New York, I took over as full owner and made Caroline's into a full-fledged comedy club. Soon after, as it would be around the country, comedy took over. Future comedian superstars like Billy Crystal, Bill Maher, Robin Williams, Pee Wee Herman, Sandra Bernhardt were staples of the club. It was an amazing time to be in New York, an amazing time to be in the business of comedy. But I had higher aspirations. I wanted to elevate the art of comedy. I wanted to take it out of the dark, smoke-filled rooms with a fake brick wall and give it the feel of New York's classic old nightclubs, being upscale with great cocktails, food, and great entertainment. So I moved Caroline's from Chelsea to the seaport. Not long after, the city approached me to be part of the re revitalization of Times Square in the early 90s. So after a very successful run at Pier 17, I found myself on the Great White Way among the many great Broadway theaters. I moved the club to a new office tower and Caroline's on Broadway was born. In the more than 25 years that I've been in Times Square, my pl club played host to the biggest and brightest stars in comedy as well as serving as a breeding gown for comedy's next generation of superstars. We have raised more than $56 million for the Bob Woodruff Foundation, whose mission is to ensure that our veterans and their families thrive in the next chapter of their lives. As I stand here before you and reflect on my career in the entertainment industry, I feel a tremendous sense of gratitude and pride for all that I've accomplished. I didn't accomplish this by myself. I had lots of help my partner, Andrew Fox, my producing partners, Louis Ferranda. I have, I have a great support system who made all of this happen for me. And I could not be prouder that everything that I have made, I made in New York. Thank you very much. I'm so flattered and humbled by this, uh, by this award. Uh, you know, I have been in business over 35 years in New York City, which is um, a challenge in itself to be in business, and to be, but to be honored for my creative impact to the city is, 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 I'm truly flattered and humbled by it. I think women are probably poised right now is, is the best time, and these women that are here today, all these creative forces, I mean, I think it's a fabulous time for women. I mean, women are now getting their just due, um, and um, you know, there'll be more and more producing in New York because of all the other opportunities out there of people buying content in New York. And now on to our host, our good friend Nancy Giles. Nancy Giles is an Emmy Award winning contributor to CBS News Sunday morning and was in films with director Mike Nichols, Clint Eastwood, and Woody Allen, among others. 
As a regular guest of, on MSNBC, Giles finds the funny about politics and culture. She hosts the variety show The Mosquito, and her excellent podcast, The Giles Files, is on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Please welcome the fabulous Nancy Giles. I was trying to tell you, cut it, cut it. All right. Thank you all. I'm thrilled to be back at the Muse Awards with all of you amazing women. I really am. Because what is a muse, really? It's a source of inspiration, a guiding spirit, a goddess even. And let's be honest, when you think muse, you think Nancy Giles. Okay. <laughs> I love that joke every year, it never gets old. <laughs> this, oh, oh, I, this is where I tell a very quick women in film story, which I'm gonna do very quickly. Um, those of you who are in SAG and AFTRA recognize these envelopes that have the little window, you know? This is when you might get a residual check, you get these in the mail. This is how I open those envelopes because I'm so excited <laughs> to get them. And although, that's how it is, although it ended up being a check for $7.67, for an episode of Fresh Prince that I did almost 30 years ago. I, I, my plan was to bring it and show it to you. I deposited it. I'm sorry, it's my money. But here's the thing. Thanks to women in film and TV, we'll have more of these that are more money, more money, more money. So rock on. This is a particularly special year as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of Muse. Nywift has honored some of the best and brightest in the business throughout its storied history. Let's take a look back at some of our favorite moments. As women, we're all things. We raise children, we raise the bar, we raise hope. As we look ahead, I will be inspired by the stories of women here today and women throughout the history of our movements and organizations who have refused to be silent. We are no longer dancing backward and in high heels. We are on terra firma and we are indeed calling the shots. We are awake now in a way that we never have been before. And we have infinite stories to tell and the world is listening. Congratulations, Nywift, on 40 years of Muse. It is an honor to be celebrating the women who are this year's Muse recipients, women of undeniable talents and staggeringly impressive accomplishments. So let's get this party started. You may know her as one of the most successful crossover artists in Latin music history, who has performed at the White House for five presidents, two popes, I'm so glad I got to do a selfie with you, we'll rub off, and sold 100 million albums. She is a multi-award winning Grammy singer and songwriter. Among her accolades, she has received the National Medal of Freedom and the Gershwin Prize. If that weren't enough, she is a producer of the international acclaimed Broadway musical On Your Feet. But did you know that Gloria Estefan received an Oscar nomination for her song Music of My Heart? Or that she's written two best-selling children's books? Let's take a look at the work of this multifaceted talent. Isabel Vasquez, second grade. Hi, I'm Roberta Gaspari. The violin teacher. I know. So you stuffed some worthless piece of caca into the casket with Ophelia? You knew? Of course I knew. No one gets buried with a mantilla. We're Cubans, not ancient Egyptians. <laughs> Come on, we gotta do that live. One, two, three, four. Come on, baby, let me take it to that conga. No, you can't control yourself. And it longer. Ladies and gentlemen, Gloria Estefan. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.
I am beyond honored and privileged to be sharing this dais with these amazing women and everyone here in the room. Muses, you know, a songwriter, a writer, person that shares art with anyone is constantly praying for that muse to come down and beat you over the head with something. But I grew up with two muses that really led by example, my mother and my grandmother. Oh, and one guy, my husband Emilio, who is here today. I say grew up with, because I met him at 17 and has been an amazing inspiration to me and motivator because that's what we need. Our muses have to motivate, they have to inspire. They have to make us think that something is possible. My grandmother who was born in 1905 wanted to be a lawyer in Cuba. She got pulled out of school in fourth grade because she needed to help her family, 12 brothers and sisters survive, quite honestly. And when she came to this country at 57 years old, not speaking the language, she said to my grandfather, what are we going to do here? And she rented a house that abutted a, a park that where men, Cuban men mostly, brought their sons to play Little League. And she went over there and realized that there were no concessions. So she borrowed a cart from one of the grocery stores, <laughs> pulled all her resources, made tamales, croquetas, pan con lechon, all these amazing Cuban staples, she took some Cuban soft drinks, kawi, and put them on ice, and went over to the, to the baseball field. She sold out within 30 minutes. She continued to do this and created a business that in the 60s was making five grand in cash a week. Wow. Now mind you, yes, yes grandma. I was there by her side every step of the way, helping her in the kitchen, helping her do this, and trying to call my parents when she got arrested for having an illegal restaurant in her house. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. She talked her way out of it, just like she talked me into actually following my musical dream because believe it or not, I don't like being the center of attention. I had to really get used to that role, but I sing since I talk. It came with me, a uh, musical family on both sides. And I think my grandma was secretly you know, a performer that never got to do anything. So we came to the United States, I was two and a half years old. My grandma, you heard what she ended up doing. My mom, uh, my father went to the Bay of Pigs invasion and ended up being a political prisoner there for two years. And in this time, my mom found an apartment for us to live, a brand new one, which was a miracle in Miami at that time, and then proceeded to convince the landlord to let her move all of her posse into the other apartments, which were other women with toddlers with their men in Cuba in jail. My mom went back to school and she became a teacher. She taught for 25 years in the uh, Dade County public school system, all the while raising my sister and I, sending us to prep school and making me sing for everyone that would come to our living room. <laughs> Bottom line is we all need our muses. We love them. They come in every way, shape and form you can imagine, sometimes when you don't even imagine. I just feel so privileged and so blessed to have made a life in music, to have made a life with my hubby. We've been married 42 years, is it already? Yes. So congratulations to all the women here. Emilio and I have always tried to give a hand up to any artist that is trying to break through because we got a lot of no's and we're all about the yes, right baby? Nothing empowers you like someone telling you no. So take every no that you receive, turn it around and do with it what you want and make them think that it was their idea. That's the best thing. Thank you so much. Congratulations to all the women here. It's incredibly important for me, first of all, that they've been awarding women for 40 years. I think it's important to recognize the women that have broken ground in a field that's been kind of tough uh, in many respects. Uh, I work very closely with a project that um, is going to empower women in film and, and both on the producing and writing side. So to see this organization doing this for so long is really an honor. I, I love and have been moved by everyone on that day as today receiving an award through their work or their life. So it's, it's always a beautiful thing to be a part of something that's groundbreaking and, and new and 40 years isn't that new, but it's still relevant and we still have to fight for all those rights of women to get into the important jobs in, in the entertainment field.
My two muses were my grandmother and my mother, who I, through example, saw do everything because of circumstances that life threw at them. My father's illness, my grandfather uh, passing away when he came to this country, and I saw my grandmother and my mother doing everything and doing it well. Uh, I think we just have to stay true to our creative spirits, not let anyone come and tell us you have to change this in order to make it, or this isn't the way that we want it. You have to stick very true to your creative identity and your ideas, which is what we did through music, despite everyone trying to tell us you know, that it would never work. And uh, you know, try to balance. To me, the key word is balance, because women are always going to care about their families and, and their children or extended family. And sometimes it's hard to find your own time for your own uh, you know, endeavors and the creative efforts that women do. Now it's time for the Lorene Arbus Changemaker Award. And before we get to it, I want to first tell you a little about Lorene Arbus. Lorene is the president of the Lorene Arbus Foundation, the Goldenson Arbus Foundation, and Lorene Arbus Productions, Inc. Her philanthropy supports a broad scope of interests, including advocacy for women and girls, as well as for the world's largest minority, people with disabilities. Widely recognized for her humanitarian and professional accomplishments, Lorene has received the Heart of Giving Award presented by President Bill Clinton and headed up a Clinton Global Initiative, which will help more disabled people build careers in the entertainment industry. Please welcome the extraordinary Lorene Arbus. I am so proud to announce the winner of this year's Lorene Arbus Disability Awareness Grant, which is a cash prize awarded to a woman filmmaker for a film on physical or developmental disability issues. And very often, it also goes to a filmmaker who herself has disability. This year's winning film is like called that. Single, a narrative short film by Ashley Eakin, who could not be with us today. But we need to all see and appreciate this film. It explores the complexities of dating with a disability. Troy Peters, high school, in front of the whole freshman class. Yeah! yeah. We are thrilled to see what else Ashley Eakin has in store for us as a filmmaker. Part of my annual grant goes to the wonderful programs of NYWIT in addition to the filmmaker. And another aspect of the award, which doesn't bring money with it, is called the Change Maker Award for those who take action and affect change. It's so brave of those who have done this, and I just hope we'll see a lot more people, men and women, men have won this award too. Shoshana Stern is going to be receiving this award and she represents the fourth generation of a deaf family. She is the only deaf actor in history to have roles on two primetime television shows, shows at the same time, Jericho on CBS and Weeds on Showtime. And she is the creator, writer, and star of Sundance TV's this Close, which just wrapped its second season. Here's a look at some of her work. I'm a badass woman. What's wrong with that? Can't hold me back. Why is she doing that with her hands? Is she an Italian? She's speaking and listening with her hands. She says hi. Phil Dermot's a killer. Dermot's a demon. Right there. Demon. Nice. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I actually don't need these. <laughs> Being here with these wonderful storytellers and all of you out there is incredibly meaningful. I grew up listening to stories from my parents. They would express those stories in sign language. I'm the fourth generation in my family who's born deaf. Everybody I knew used signs to communicate. And that was certainly not a barrier. It was a gift. Because I never saw myself as anything other than myself, except for when I saw myself as a princess in those stories. <laughs> and I shared the stories with my friends, some of whom expressed themselves normally, and when I say normally, it means they express themselves the way I did. 
and other of my friends were different, which means not like me, and they used their mouths. But I accepted them anyway, and I was a little curious about them. <laughs> their language was in the same order as the books I loved to read, so I felt that that was a pretty easy language to learn. And sometimes I wondered if they knew they were different. <laughs> and then, my first day in kindergarten in public school, my teacher wrote this word on the board. Disabled. And she explained that that word meant broken. It meant that something was wrong with a person. And that word was a very important per word for the class because we actually had a child with a disability in the class. And I remember looking around, wondering who it was that fit that description. <laughs> and then the teacher pointed at me. And at the age of five, I realized that the way I saw myself and the way I, the world saw me was different that they would never see me as the princess in that story. So I looked as hard as I could for stories of my own. And I tried in film and television field because everything was accessible. It had captions. And in the real world, they didn't. And I'm very grateful for that. But in still, when I was looking for someone like me on the screen, their stories were always centered about loss. But my life was never about loss. Not about the loss of being able to hear, much like a woman's life is not about the loss of the ability to be a man. <laughs> right? All right. <laughs> All right. And so at first I waited for a prince to come riding on a white charger and tell my story for me. But after a while, I realized that even though I thought casting myself as a princess was groundbreaking, it wasn't enough. Even if I successfully put myself in that space, I was going to wait forever for someone to tell my story unless the story changed. So I started writing. And when we got feedback from our stories on Sundance TV, specifically about the deaf experience, it didn't scare people as had been anticipated. It is what drew them, even though the majority of our audience is not deaf and still is not deaf. And I think that's why film and TV is so important and that artists define power as perspective because perspective really means how we see the world. And once we see through other people's eyes, we recognize that there is just one world that we live in with an incredible variety of ways to live within it. I have learned the only way to show your own unique and valuable perspective is to occupy your space. By doing that, we are collectively creating more room for everyone. Under the surface of our bodies, whatever those surfaces may be, we are all the same. And that is what makes us and keeps us human. Thank you. I really cannot tell you in words how important this is for me. I think especially as a woman, I know that women are taught from early childhood to make ourselves smaller, to cross our legs, and men keep their legs open. I feel like this is happening emotionally as well, and that we have to regulate our emotions so that other people are comfortable, that women are too emotional or not emotional enough. And I think the only way to really own your experience and own your being is to tell stories by occupying your own space. And I think that is really what these awards are all about. So. It's incredibly meaningful for me to be here today. For many of us, Vimeo has become an instrumental tool as we tell our stories. There's a real dynamo leading the charge here, Anjali Sood. 
She's been designated a young global leader of the World Economic Forum and oversees about 600 people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anjali Sood. Hey! Congratulations. Come on. Thank Here's you. your beautiful award. If you want me to put it right there. Thank you. It's a true privilege to be here today speaking to a room of icons and powerhouses and personal heroes. Most of you probably don't recognize me, which makes sense. I don't work in front of or behind the camera. I work in tech. Um, I work for the people, or I work behind the people um, behind the camera. Uh, my job is to power your talent and your creativity so that your stories can have a real impact on the world. So some of you might know Vimeo. Some of you might use Vimeo. Uh, some of you might think Vimeo is the mobile payment app Venmo. That a lot. In which case, you're probably really confused as to why I'm here. That Vimeo is the world's largest ad-free open video platform. We're also a thriving creative community of filmmakers, artists, and brands. And in today's harsh digital climate, we aim to be that rare place on the internet where the creator and their story always comes first. You can see this come to life just by reading the comments section of the videos posted on Vimeo. Um, I often read them. And you won't find trolls. Instead, you will find surprisingly kind notes of positivity, support, and inspiration. I feel very lucky to be here representing the tech side of our industry and a platform that values positive community and diversity in voices. So funnily enough, I had a very unusual career path uh, to get where I am today. Uh, I grew up in Flint, Michigan. My parents are immigrants from India. Um, went to college, studied finance. I uh, had no idea what I wanted to do in my 20s, was rejected from every finance job, bounced around from um, investment banking to selling diapers online. Uh, <laughs> yes, I did that. Um, five years ago, I joined Vimeo as a mid-level marketer with a team of five. Uh, three years later, I became CEO at 34 years old. Oh my God. <laughs> Leading a billion dollar company with hundreds of employees around the world. Still pinch myself, I think I'm dreaming. That I got the job because over those three years I developed a new strategy that was risky, but that I really believed in. And I called that strategy Creators First. And it meant focusing Vimeo solely on empowering the people behind the camera with tools, technology, and a community. And it turns out that putting Creators First isn't just a good thing to do. It's also a great business. So after a year of proving that strategy could work, I got the top job to make it happen. So uh, my path hasn't been predictable, and it hasn't been easy. Uh, I remember being told in an interview that I didn't have the personality for a job in finance. Uh, I remember my first day as CEO walking into a boardroom with no direct experience, and every single person looked different from me in every way. I remember coming back from maternity leave uh, and going to an all-day investor conference and literally running back and forth between presentations uh, to pump in the bathroom stall because I didn't have a room for women. So I never thought I'd be here today, but with the support of my community, my family, colleagues, business partners, here I am. And I get to accept a Muse Award <laughs> and stand next to remarkable women. <laughs> I just want to take this last moment to say wholeheartedly that your stories, of the women up here and all of you in this room, your stories are my muse. They inspire me to lead Vimeo with empathy and grit, to build a powerful, safe, and supportive online platform, to provide useful technology to keep our community thriving, and to continue to push the boundaries in pursuit of something better. So to all the storytellers in the room, uh, I can't wait to see what you create next. 
And if you happen to share it on Vimeo, know that I will be watching, reading those comments, and cheering you on. Thank you. I've spent most of my career admiring uh, the other women honorees as personal heroes. So uh, it's, it's great to be here and to be representing women in tech. Um, I'm CEO of Vimeo, lead a video platform, and my job is to empower the people behind the camera to tell their stories. Um, and women in particular need that now more than ever. So uh, it means a lot to be here, um, and it's very surreal. The best advice I have is find your community. Find a group of people who will support you and lift you up and encourage you because we all need that um, and no one ever gets anywhere alone. Um, so find that community and um, embrace it. The Handmaid's Tale, Olive Kittredge, The Leftovers. Those are just three of the many gems that have an extra sparkle thanks to brilliant performances from Ann Dowd. This in-demand actress has won an Emmy, was nominated for a Golden Globe, and yes, she was on Law and Order nine times. <laughs> and wonderful in all nine. Here are some examples of her outstanding work. God gives us blessings and he gives us challenges. The price of his love is sometimes high, but it must be paid. Ladies and gentlemen, Anne Dowd. Oh, darlings, hello, all of you. I just gave myself, oh, very loud, uh, a firm talking to, and I said, if you faint in your chair or here on the stage, you are wasting everyone's time. I was raised Catholic, so that landed. Uh, I'm very happy to be in your company, and I'm very grateful. I honestly, after hearing these women speak, should sit in my chair. And I'm not even kidding because I don't feel worthy, but that's a waste of everyone's time as well. So I say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I want to also thank Margaret Atwood, whom I love very much. Thank you, Margaret. I remember coming to New York, and all I had going for me was a fierce, fierce desire, a kind of panicked energy. And all I asked of myself is, please, don't ever give up. I remember standing in front of a Broadway house, many of them, and I would put my arms up like this, and I would say, thank you, I'm coming. Uh, soon, and I'm not going to be in the audience. Thank you very much. The people around me, even though it is New York, would be like, mm-mm, this isn't going to go well. <laughs> this girl needs a little help, a little protection. <laughs> Somehow in New York City, I never felt like a loner, and I never felt like an outsider. I don't know why. Something about the notion that reality is our friend, and that's what we go by. We put our feet on the ground, and we go from here to there. The number of times I have walked to auditions just to get the strength to go in the damn room. I remember auditions in which I couldn't get the words out, and the report from my agent was, okay, honey, what's happening here? You are required to speak in the room. I said, no, I, 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 I do know that. The first time I met, I met Jonathan Demi, beautiful Jonathan Demi, and I just stared at him. And I kept thinking, honey, speak. Because you know, you have to say not just the lines, but you have to tell them something about yourself so that they think, okay, she'd be all right. Somehow he saw through it and gave me the part. Uh, I think I looked like Tom Hanks at the time. Uh, or at least that I could be related to him. Uh, I remember leaving and going to the 
pay phone and I called my agent who worked so hard to get this appointment for me. And I said, honey, all I can tell you is I did the machine. I left a message. I did the best I could, and that's all I can say to you. And I know I didn't get it, but I thank you for going to the trenches for me. I got home, and there was a message. She was screaming with happiness. You're meeting Tom Hanks tomorrow. And <laughs> long story short, I remember having the courage to ask her, how in the world did I get the part? She said, because the woman needed to be a mother who didn't work, who had no aspirations to work. And that's what she came across as. Uh, so if there was a message in that, it is this. You never know. I, I came from a pre-med background in college, four years of it. And let me tell you how that works. You study, and then you study again. And then you get up and you study. And you don't go home for Christmas vacation. And you learn to love and accept anxiety as your best and only friend. Don't recommend it. Now, there are other ways through, but let's just say that's the route I went. There is one answer in physics, and it's a number. And there is one answer in organic chemistry, and it's a carbon molecule, can I just say. Senior year, my beautiful roommate, we had both lost someone very special to us. She, her brother, and I, my father. Grief is a, a beautiful thing, isn't it? Because it teaches you, don't fool around with life. No, no, honey, there isn't the time. And she said to me, just before an exam, senior year, you want to be a, a doctor? Is that where, where you're going here? And I said, no, no, I want to be an actress. And she said, put the application away to medical school. What are you doing? I said, OK, very good. And that was the last of it. I remember going to acting school the following year and applying the same rules that pre-med offered. I will know this character. I will study it. I will read the play several times, and I will know the character. That's how I'm doing it. Thank you very much. I will be the best ever. Uh, as you may know, acting doesn't work that way. As it turns out, it's a relationship, a friendship of respect in which you say to the beautifully written characters such as Aunt Lydia, I'll tell you about me what you tell me about you, and let's see how we go. Patience, process, trust. I'll tell you the journey I'm most grateful for and that's the one from fear to trust. I think aging is undervalued because at some point you say, what am I running from, for goodness sakes? Please trust the gift you were given. Please trust that around you there is support. Trust yourself and trust that there is a place at the table for you. Muse to me means find the source of love in your life and go by it. Thank you so very, very much. I don't know how it is that I am this fortunate. I think of all the hardworking, extraordinary human beings in this world and that I should have this honor. I am so deeply grateful. That's how I feel. Next up, we have the Nancy Malone Directing Award, named for Nancy Malone, one of the first women television directors. Throughout her career, Nancy never failed to reach down to lend a hand up to the women coming behind her, much like this next nominee. Casey Lemons is a formidable force, kind of like the woman at the center of her latest film, Harriet. That's right, give it up. She made everyone take notice with her directorial debut, Eve's Bayou. And she has acted in many films and TV shows. When she isn't doing all that, Lemons is an NYU professor and a committed mentor to women filmmakers. That's right, let's take a look at some of her work. Stand up, take my people with me together.
Um, it's, it's such an experience to be honored here with such incredible women, by such incredible women, and for such incredible women and men that are here with us. It's amazing. Uh, for the past two and a half years, I've had the incredible good fortune to have had as my muse one of the most awesome women, in fact, one of the most incredible humans to ever walk the face of the earth. I'm talking about the fierce freedom fighter and feminist Harriet Tubman. I first looked young Harriet Tubman in the eyes in early 2017. I was at the New York office of producer Daniela Toplin Lemberg, standing before a newly surfaced photograph of Harriet, circa 19, 1860s. It shows a, a slim young woman seated gracefully in a chair, looking boldly at camera, fierce and righteous, a hint of amusement in her eyes. And just like that, I fell in love. And I believe that it's a love that will last the rest of my life. Once I was formally invited onto the project that Daniela Toplin Lumberg and Deborah Martin Chase were producing, starring Cynthia Erivo, I spent the rest of 2017 immersed in research. I read every biography on Tubman, every book on the Underground Railroad, and every slave narrative I could find. And I found the details of her story much more fantastic and stranger than I had ever imagined. She came vividly to life, this tiny, powerful, mystic warrior, driven to escape slavery by a burning desire for freedom and motivated to return by a fierce love of family and a deep, unshakable sense of justice. The mystic in Harriet spoke to the mystic in me. Harriet believed that she was in direct conversation with God, who guided her every move. And I came to believe I was in direct conversation with her and that she was guiding my artistic process. Harriet had epileptic, epileptic seizures which brought incredibly prescient visions that saved her life and the lives of her followers. She told me about them late at night, her husky voice filling in the details of my research. I prayed to her every night and I said her name every morning when I woke up. She was with me as I endeavored to bring the authenticity and detail of her life to the script written by Gregory Allen Howard. She was with us both in spirit and the, in the excellent personification created by the impeccable Golden Globe nominated Cynthia Erivo. <laughs> as we shivered in the woods at night, knowing that whatever our hardship or discomfort we endured while making the film was nothing compared to what Harriet and the freedom-seeking slaves she led endured, cold and frightened and hunted, yet bravely pushing towards freedom. Since I finished the film, her voice has faded somewhat, and I miss our conversations though I know she'll be with me and she'll always be a part of me. I wonder what she would think of us now. We still have to fight for inclusion and parity for equal rights and human rights. We have to fight for our planet and our children and their children. And like Harriet, we have to urge on those whose courage fails them. We have to fight alongside and for each other and not let anyone divide us. Because together, we have the power to change the world through the sheer force of our will. If our courage and our humanity, our conviction and our sense of justice outweighs our fear. So thank you so much. Women in Film and Television, this is so meaningful. And I'm, I'm accepting this for Harriet. I love this organization, but also this award's very special to me. And um, yeah, I, I feel so honored. I feel so honored to be in this company and just in this room with so many fabulous women who are, you know, working in film and television. You know, my mother always, my mother was a, a psychologist and she worked with young women a lot. And she would always say, you know, 
keep going. Just head towards your goal and keep going. If you come to an obstacle, go through it. Keep going. And um, I realize now that that was kind of inspired by Harriet Tubman, which I didn't know. You know, I didn't think about it at the time. But now when I look at my mother's words and the words of inspiration that, that she gave me and that I, I like to give young women, it's really the same, you know. Uh, it stems kind of from Harriet, you know. Keep going. Don't let anything stop you. Keep going. Don't take no for an answer. Keep going. To celebrate the 40th anniversary Muse Awards, Nye Wift has created a new award to honor a past Muse whose commitment to the industry is as long-standing as its own, the Career Impact Achievement Award. Jane Rosenthal has a career that falls into the wildest dreams category for many of us. CEO and co-founder of Tribeca Enterprises. Here are some reasons why we love her. these millions of people who come through here and I see them all people of every color shape and size and I think about all those people that made it congratulations thank you, thank you so much I'm so honored to be here uh, and inspired by all of you muses and um, it's really extraordinary thank you so much for your stories. Thank you, New York Women in Film and Television, for that lovely clip compilation. Um, I actually couldn't help notice, but uh, you left out the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> <laughs> May maybe you didn't see it? Did you see it? <laughs> a, a lot of people didn't see it. Actually, I, I remember uh, the day after the movie opened, my phone literally stopped ringing. No one called, not even my mother. <laughs> this was the summer of 2000 before the proliferation of cell phones, texting, and Bitmoji. So I kept dialing the operator to check if my landline was still working. <laughs> it was fine. That's when I learned that old saying, you're only as good as your last movie is. Like many cliches, painfully true. Fortunately, I had a real fearless leader in my corner, Robert De Niro. Thank you, Bob. Bob's had oral surgery this morning, so he's not speaking. Uh, uh, wherever, where are you, Bob? Oh, there, there you are. Um, but he asked me to say he asked me to say two things. Uh, first, I quote. <clears throat> New York women in film and television, keep up the good work. <laughs> oh, and, and you too, Jane. <laughs> and second, um, for, for Trump, Bob, I can't say this, something Trump, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not reading that. Anyway, anyway, forget. Uh, so anyway, eventually the phone started uh, ringing again. Even my mother started to take my calls. <laughs> of course, it didn't hurt when three months later, meet the parents open. <laughs> However, you learn more from your failures than your successes. And no matter what, you have to keep pushing forward. Take the Irishman, for example. Bob first read I Heard You Paint Houses as research for another film we are going to make in 2007. Finally, after a long process, we ended up getting a draft from Steve Zalian of The Irishman in 2009. To be clear, that was 10 years ago. So you have Scorsese, De Niro, Pesci, Steve Zalian, and we still hit roadblocks. Every studio said no. We pushed through a decade of challenges to make a film that seemed impossible. I feel like everything I do is a startup. It doesn't necessarily get any easier. As philosopher George Santiago said, the difficult is that which can be done immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. 
In the aftermath of 9-11, Bob and I knew it was imperative for us to do something for our community, and we had to do it fast. No was not an option. We didn't even consider the difficult. We went right to the impossible. 238 days after 9-11, we opened this Tribeca Film Festival. This April, we'll be celebrating the 19th Tribeca Film Festival. But the thing is, I only thought I was doing it once. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Women in Film and Television, for the inaugural Career Impact Achievement Award. This is a real honor. But as my friend Alma Harrell said yesterday on Twitter, Twitter do not look for justice in the award systems. It is wonderful to be acknowledged, but you don't manifest justice or impact with an award. We create impact when we commit to do something. All of us here have a passion. We, ought, we must also commit to supporting each other to promote and produce underrepresented voices. This year, those passions came together for me with Ava DuVernay and When They See Us, the story of the exonerated five. All of us fight for equity for women and the underrepresented, not just in our business, but in every business. We don't have the luxury of congratulating ourselves on just how far we've come. The Equal Rights Amendment was brought before Congress 100 years ago and was passed 50 years later. Today, we're still waiting for it to be ratified. It takes all of us in this room and beyond to ensure that our voices are heard loud and clear, not just locally, but globally. These are not normal times. No matter the failures or challenges we face, we have to keep pushing forward. As storytellers, as artists, executive, activists, stewards, we have never been held back by normal, and we cannot be held back by no. It's not an option. So all of you in this room, you might know Bob's favorite four-letter word. <laughs> I actually now have two favorite four-letter words. One is muse. Thank you to all you extraordinary muses. Uh, and the other is next. Let's go, ladies. Jane Rosenthal, you forgot your award. <laughs> You're welcome. Woo! Oh my God. Congratulations, everyone, and congratulations, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. De Niro, and thank you and congratulations to all of our honorees. Thank you for all the love and support of all these New York women in film and television. Thanks so much for coming and see you next year.